here once more with uh, James Fallon. Thank you for uh, for joining me. Duncan, how you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, I'm in Utah right now, hence why I'm on my phone. Uh huh. But uh, the the last time that we had talked, the the one thing that I didn't uh, get to uh, that I wanted to uh, was about stem cells. You you've done, from what I understand, you've done a lot of work in stem cells. Uh, can can you talk just a little bit about uh, what you've done, like what sort of uh, discoveries you've made, or uh, my understanding of stem cells is very limited, but I just it seems like a miracle cure. Well, we started <clears throat> working on this, and it, it, as most science goes, it was by serendipity that we happened to see this. It was a, a surgery that we had. We were injecting a different peptide growth factors, natural ones that are you know in the body, and in particular transforming growth factor alpha. And we were uh, one of the young students kind of messed up the surgery, but in doing so, I put the injected it into the brain in a, in a place in this animal uh, that was wrong, but it ended up creating a whole idea. So that was back in the, oh my God, the mid nineties. We had started working on looking for cures for Parkinson's disease. And so we were looking at ways of uh, stimulating the part of the brain that's lost, the dopamine part that's lost in the brains. So we're testing it on animals and uh, and part of this, what happened, the mistake is we saw all of these cells in the brain that shouldn't have been there. Well, all of a sudden, there was a whole, all these cells were dividing like crazy into almost, you know, like a millions of new cells. And we went, good God. I mean, it was, you know, really startling. And we we're able to move where they went. That is, we we're able to move in the brain uh, where these cells went, uh, and we were able to direct it to where there was damage that we had inflicted that was like Parkinson's disease. And so well, that followed up with about 10 years of research to find out what the origin of these stem cells were. It's not embryonic stem cells. These are not stem cells that were transplanted from somewhere else or from embryos. These are stem cells that are resident that nobody even thought were in the brain. You know, they're, they're in the gut and the skin because you keep turning over these tissues. But uh, we found it in the brain and it was highly unusual. And so uh, we had looked at uh, how these, the number of neurons in human cortex was increasing too. So at the end of this uh, first part of the experiments, uh, the New York Times said that in the 10 years of the decade of the brain, 1990 through 2000, that this was the most startling finding. And so we followed that up with a stroke models uh, for looking for cures for stroke because we were doing basic research. We weren't doing this in patients yet. And so we were able, we were the first group that was able to show that uh, these stem cells that are naturally in the brain, they're lining the ventricles, you know, the fluid filled cavities in the brain. And they were kind of laying there and with the right, with damage, it was like an alarm system went off. And, and if we added this growth, natural growth factor, it's called TGF alpha, that it was able to stimulate these to divide and move, like I said, where we wanted to. And so we did a series of publications and uh, somebody came in and you know, raised $7 million to try to get it to a clinic. And there it's been held up because of the, oh, a couple of things, you know. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's, we're still waiting to see if we can ever move this forward. But we tested it for... A, you know, chronic stroke, that is long-standing stroke, and um, and also for Parkinson's. So that was uh, pretty much, uh, it, you know, most people found it like an amazing finding, but it all started by just a, a botched surgery. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that almost reminds me of the discovery of penicillins, you know, total accident. Right. That people it's pursue an accident. That. And it's usually, you know, there's usually a couple of people involved. One of course, is the young person who makes the mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I like to blame. But but if you if you have enough experience, if you've seen, you know, this is usually where some of a lot of experience, they you know they may have not have been there to create that situation, but it's in their lab and they look at it and say, well, this is different, and this is probably how it's different, and then create experiments. 
So I was working with this young student, a couple, actually it was several students in, in my lab. It was a group thing in my lab. And, uh, but since it was so different, you know, it's like the hounds weren't barking. That was the, it was something that was really wrong and we followed it up, it took years and years. And so it was quite exciting. Um, when you said it's been held up, is that because of, of concerns of people like the religious right? I, I know that the embryonic stem cells were uh, oh, the people on the religious people on the religious right love this. I mean, this is this is using your own natural stem cells and just giving them a boost with a natural. This is like the brain healing itself. No, they, you know, I, there's no problem with it. It's just that. There was the push from NIH and all the funding agencies and the press and everything for embryonic stem cells, which hasn't quite panned out. So hopefully we'll, you know, we'll get back to this. You have to be patient sometimes. And, and also, you know, you can, raising 7 million is one thing. Going to the next stage to raise 30 or 40 million is kind of a jump, you know. And that's, uh, and, you know, you have to work with the CEO. The CEO put that money in. And, and so... Um, and also you're fighting a clock, you know, the you're fighting the intellectual property patent clock. And so, you you know, if you put it out too soon, you only can run it for, you know, seven years and then you can up it to 17 years. This is what happens. It takes a long time to really not only discover these things, right, because they're out of they're completely new. So nobody ex expects this stuff. It's uh, you know purely by serendipity at first. And then you say, what is going on? You got to imagine what's happening. And so any rate, uh, that whole thing is like driving down for in football. You know, you make the basic finding. It gets from your goal line to the 20-yard line. Now you got to take it from, to the midfield. And that's, you know, with biotech money, 7 to $10 million. And then after that clinical trials, it could be up to upwards to 50 to $100 million or more. So wow. st it's stepwise. And, and meanwhile, you're right. You're, 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 you're kind of fighting this uh, patent clock. And, uh, and so anyway, what do you it's, mean by, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go, I, was, I, I was just saying, what do you mean you're fighting the, uh, the patent clock as in it, it's gonna, you only have a certain amount of time to reap a reward on the investment that people are, are making well, in there. Well, not so much, you know, yeah, it, it ultimately, because in order for a company, you know, a pharmaceutical company to put in a hundred million dollars, they want to be able to make sure it's protected. Or else they can't protect that at all. So therefore, everybody steals it. They put a hundred million dollars in, and other everybody else makes money. They don't want to do that. So you can't raise the money. I see. Um, speaking of of brain injuries, what about CTE? Have you done much research in that? I mean, I used to play rugby, and I got a couple of concussions. Uh, yeah. Should I be worried? Well, uh, concussions are reversible. You know, I played football and had a number of them and kind of did a tune on me. Uh, your, your vulnerability to CTE, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, seems to also be partially genetically based. It's how, how your brain, uh, as dictated by your genes, are able to process the tau protein. And uh, in some people, it doesn't happen. Some people, it does. So it's partially, you know, a, a genetic vulnerability, like many uh, disorders. And but it's the, you know, the continuous hitting over and over and over again. And uh, plus, it, and, and it transforms into something that almost looks like Alzheimer's disease a, a bit. And it does damage in the specific areas that were hit. I just uh, I, I, I did a you know, a podcast yesterday with uh, Dr. Drew and it's on, it's published. I mean, he just, you know, he posted it. We did it yesterday with Colin and it was on the Aaron Hernandez case uh, where, you know, we, he uh, was a star tight end for the new England Patriots and had many problems. He ended up with CT and committed suicide. So there's a whole show, an hour show I did on that yesterday. If somebody wants to look at that. People could just find that on, on your, uh, Twitter page or Dr. Drew's Yes, page? it's my, my Twitter page. But if it's, if you go to drdrew.tv or just to his page, he put it up. Uh, he put that interview up. That was from yesterday. Um, I had also known that you, you've you done some studies on um, you know, trying to understand the brains of, of politicians and powerful people um, I, and, and dictators, especially. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had read some study um, 
that it showed that the people, that the brains of people who held on to power for a long period of time um, almost exhibited signs of like brain damage. Their frontal lobe was, was shrunk, um, poor impulse control. Uh, do you think that a lot of problems in our politics are just because people uh, aren't respecting the limits of the human brain? Well, yeah, I've given yeah, I've given a number of uh, talks in Europe and in uh, Russia and um, the United States and in Asia on dictators. I've done a series on Putin and other people, and uh, gave a talk. Oh God, it was about ten years ago on the brains of dictators, and I looked through dictators where I could get everything on their life that I could. So those that I had a lot of information on their life to just kind of uh, put together their upbringing, every one of them, every one of them was abused or abandoned in the first few years of life, uh, including Putin. Uh, the only one that said that he was never had any problem was Pol Pot. He's the only one out of hundreds and hundreds that I looked at. But at any rate, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's partially a mix of, of things that is, we talk about brain damage, that loss of control of the frontal lobe. Um, that can be done by damage or by epigenetic changes in the connections of the emotional brain with the thinking brain uh, because they have certain genetics that predispose you to that and uh, to psychopathy, for example. And if you have those genes and you're abused or abandoned in the first few years of life, it's big trouble. Uh, you can't, here's the, you know, there's some caveats here. First of all, you can't, analyze or or you can't diagnose somebody by looking at their you know reading about them or looking at their talks or everything you have to have a qualified a psychologist or psychiatrist who's an expert in personality disorders uh, sit down with them for several days and do these structured and unstructured psych exams uh by an expert a lot of people a lot of times it's not done even in prison by experts and so uh, these are almost always you know non-existent you know, for the, the key murders and certainly dictators, there was one who was the, you know, the, the, the butcher of Belgrade that I, uh, I had given a talk at the House of Commons uh, meeting in, in, in London. And, and in that, uh, I gave a talk and the, his, his attorneys came up to me. And, uh, you know, the, you know, the big haired guy, uh, Radovan, and, and so they wanted me to do an hour show that he would uh, test him, do the genetics and, you know, we'd have him psych psychiatrically. He's a psychiatrist, by the way, uh, tested and to see if he was a psychopath or anything. And he and he, he they got back to me and he goes, he goes, that Fallon's a son of a bitch. He's a he's a psychopath. I can't trust him. And this guy, <laughs> this guy is like the first person since the Nazis, you know, to for, for war crimes against humanity. And he's saying that he won't have it done because he doesn't trust me. It was unbelievable. So some of these guys are. So that's still up in the air whether he wants to do that. But he wants somebody more trustworthy than me. It's incredible. But uh, wow. do, you, do you think that's just paranoia on his part? Well, it's manipulativeness too. You know, he knows he's a psychiatrist. So, you know, with all of them, you can't get to them because they use the system. You know, Charlie Manson and others, other. They're, they're, they use the system to get a better deal or to get out early or to get something. And so they really never submit to um, a psychiatric genetic brain imaging tests. It's, 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 you know, we do a lot of other ones, non-famous people. And uh, we have data on those who are either impulsive murderers, psych psychopaths or disorganized sorts of murderers and all different patterns in the brain. And there's a different genetics to it that's implied, even though a lot is not known about the genetics of those murderers and certainly not the dictators. But if, if you look at the behaviors, um, I, you know, I knew the opposition and through the opposition in Syria, the Assad family had knew a lot about them. And, and also the, you know, the podiatrist, the podiatrist, pediatrician, you know, who needs a podiatrist, uh, get a foot in the door and. The pediatrician of, of uh, Assad and, and said he what he had was intermittent explosive disorder. He did not have psychopathy. He's a lousy dictator, as dictators go. But he would like just explode impulsively. He was not a psycho. He's not a psychopath, even though his father and brother were. Um, so at any rate, uh, you know it's hard to get the real data. So you, you're kind of imputing this. That is, you're guessing. You're putting together all the behavioral traits. 
And of course, people, I give talk on, talks on presidents, different politicians, uh, to try to guess what they have. And, you know, it's a no-no because you can't tell. And there's a thing called the Goldwater Rule uh, from, from 1968 with the American Psychiatric Association got fed up with people uh, who, you know, there was a, a group, and they're usually a group of Yale uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, younger ones, who are who who try to uh, dissuade people from voting for certain people. It turns out they go after Republicans all the time for some reason. But it started out with Goldwater, and they put out this paper saying Goldwater was crazy and he'd blow everybody up. It was purely political. And and after that, the APA says you can't do this anymore. There's none of this stuff. You have to analyze it and go through the, all the formalities. And, and so it's a real ethical breach. But is, if you say, look, it, we don't really know, but based on these, you know, traits, these kind of line up with the psychopathy or sociopathy. And, and here's the key. Somebody can have these psychopathic or sociopathic traits, but if somebody's a psychopath and a sociopath, they can have the exact same behaviors, but why they're doing it is very different. And in one case, the pure psychopaths, the real psychopaths, they don't have a sense of moral reasoning. So to them, what they're doing is not immoral. You know, they know you think it's immoral. So to them, it's not, they're not even sinning. They're in, in, but a sociopath, it's different. They know what they're doing is wrong. They, they have a sense of morality, uh, but they're still usually really pissed off, usually pissed off losers. And um, they're going to get even with the world with specific types of people. That's, there's, that's a different uh, uh, group. So in order to do that, you have to have a, a really skilled expert in personality disorders to interview them and talk with them, give them tests for a couple of days to determine it. But that's never done. So any guessing as to, you know, is this presidential candidate? Is this president a psychopath? It's a pure guesswork. Um, and also the reason why underneath uh, it is, 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 is really not known because they don't get really tested. Um, I didn't there, tell you anything. <laughs> Duncan, I just didn't tell you anything, did I? But I gave you the caveats. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, that was that was. Why do you think it is that uh, the the Yale psychiatrists uh, are the ones who do that? Because you said they did it with Goldwater, and and I'm yeah. sure you are aware they did it with Trump again. Oh, they did it with Trump. Same thing. Well, you know, most of the Ivy League schools, especially the law schools and the, you know, the politicals, and Yale is notorious for this, and, and Harvard is. It's very left wing. You know, it's, it's loaded up with Marxists or at least you know left wing people. And they use, they abuse the system, frankly. They they abuse the system by saying, look, we're Yale, so we're, you know, we're the smartest people in the world. And they're usually young psychologists who are really breaking those rules. Uh, and people love to hear it. And the media, mainstream media especially. Now, I did not vote for Trump, and I've never voted for a Republican ever, but, you know, fair is fair here. And, and so uh, if people are mistaking, you know, if you just don't like somebody, you call them a psychopath. I mean, this is so irresponsible. It's incredible. Uh, instead of just saying, I don't like you, you know, now it's, you know, you're either a psychopath or you're a fascist. And it's just a way of saying, I don't like you. And it's kind of childish, really. Yeah, they kind of just, it becomes almost a curse word without any sort of. Oh, yeah. And it, meaning it. It's become completely meaningless. And every people on the left and the right and people who study this know it's become meaningless, which is. You know, it's a, it's a term like racism where, you know, it's thrown around so much, it becomes it becomes very unfair to people who really are the subjects of real racism and real sexism. And real, But it's all because people just throw it around, especially in the media, that they cheapen it to the point that they're all meaningless terms now. Um, why do you think it is, uh, last thing I wanted to ask you about dictators, um, well, why do you think it is that so many of them were failed artists? Like Hitler, obviously, uh, but Stalin was a poet. Yep. So was Chairman Mao. Saddam Hussein wrote romance novels. Well, I mean, w w is there some kind of commonality between well, artistic and psychopathic yeah, traits? Yeah, I mean, those really pernicious uh, dictators, the one did a lot of killing, you know, the, under, the Stalinists, and all the, you know, the communist ones killed 120 million people, Nazis about 25 million Pol Pot, look at him. I mean, so uh, other than Pol Pot, now all the rest of them who have, they're, they're, they're not only dictators, but they're brutal, murderous di dictators. Uh, this is, of course, a sign of sociopathy. And the failed artist thing is 
you know, they were rejected early on in life, either as artists, poets, and, and now they're going to get even for the world, get even with the world and, and, and destroy that world. And in each case, it's not that so much they destroyed other people, other cultures and societies, they destroyed their own people. So it's a way of getting even. This is a sign of what is, you know, is the type two psychopath or the sociopath who knows what they're doing is wrong, but they're getting even with the world. And, you know, on an everyday basis, you know, it's a, I guess in every day, it's, you know, the, the, the guy who is bullied and, and, and wired kind of a loner loser type. It's, you know, they think they're a loser. It's, that's where it's created internally. Uh, and they are rejected early on. They, some girl who had, you know, uh, brown hair and parted it in the middle or, or blonde hair or something, and they rejected them and, and, and crushed them. So if they turn to murder, they end up chasing that if that girl around. And they'll do multiple murders of the same type of woman who rejected them. So that is, you know, uh, they really know what they're doing is wrong, and it, but that's the sociopath. They're very dangerous, and they know what they're doing is wrong. If they get caught, they show a lot of anxiety, and they'll even show remorse, you know, uh, whereas a, a true psychopath shows no anxiety or remorse and just, you know, they can kill somebody and that's just be, uh, you know, having a cocktail with you laughing the next minute because it doesn't register. And, and, and there's no morality circuit in the brain that's there. But anyway, I think, you know, that many of them, it's true. Many of the really most dangerous ones were rejected as artists. You know, uh, if you remind people that Hitler was a vegan and an artist, a lot of people don't like to hear that, you know, a lot of, right. uh, and, uh, but it's, it's true. And there are a lot of them are, are like that, but, you know, not to overdo the politics, but it doesn't matter whether you're from the far left or far right. It's really quite similar because they're almost, they're almost the same. Um, I had spoken to Noam Chomsky recently, you know, mm -hmm. talking about the, the limits of the human brain. And he seems to think that there are certain questions, like certain scientific questions, that human beings will never know the answer to, not because there isn't an answer, but because there are certain problems our brains are just not wired to conceive the answer to. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you agree with that? Well, if you um, – first of all, let me start with, you know, the past – 15 years of neuroscience, we now know that Aristotle was wrong and Plato was right. Okay, <laughs> we can start there. And um, in that, we appear to be born because of, you know, millions of years of uh, genetics. The genetics determine personality types and the circuits, the basic circuits we're born with. And so the idea that, you know, and that's a, uh, Plato's idea is that we're d born with these fundamental raw ideas in our, in our head already, sense of beauty, a sense of morality, um, you know, all, it's a, a sense of fear, different, you know, we don't have to be taught these. We, they will just develop because we're born with these circuits in our head many millions of years of evol primate evolution. So after 100 million years of this stuff of, you know, vertebrate and prosimian evolution, we seem to be born with a lot of this knowledge already in our head. This is a, a, a real surprise to people, even though Plato came up with it and he was rejected. But it was reinforced by, you know, French humanism and the post-Enlightenment, where uh, the political uh, idea affected the social idea, and the, and which is basically, hey, we're all born tabula rasa, we're blank slates, there's nothing there, and it's only society and environment that makes you who you are. Now, we know this is not true now, after the past 10 years. So that whole idea has been falsified. Now, now going from that, there are some people we talk about, you know, not only Plato, but Kant, you know, where you, it's the same sort of thing where you have this a priori that you, things you know already. Uh, and and it's a, it could be a source of creativity. It's things you don't know you know, the things you're born with, and then the internal circuits that are there. And so these things, these great ideas seem to come out de novo, a lot of creativity and, and uh, seem to come out of nowhere, but they're really just intrinsically there. You just are not aware of them. OK, so there's part of that 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 uh, that side of things. Now, there are uh, also with in the, in the history of 
thought in, the, in really the history of neuroscience too, and it's the uh, Western, mostly Western thought for you know, 2,500, 3,000 years, is that um, you know we have a sense of dualism, and we have a number of dualisms, and so we have this this thing where we only know one thing because we know the other thing to compare it to, right? And so that sort of dualism where uh, I know I'm here because I, I'm not over there, right? And I, and, and, but there are other dualisms that seem to be kind of wired in the, in the brain and which is the knowledge of the outside, what's outside your, your body and what's inside your body. Uh, another dualism is how you, the emotional processing of information versus the cognitive uh, intellectual processing. And these, all these areas are connected so because there's a connection, they're bouncing back and forth, and therefore there's a comparison. So we probably have, as these things are bouncing back and forth in the circuits, there are actual connections uh, in, with all these different sorts of uh, dualities. And the brain is set up that way. It's, it's really set up in three parts, not, not in dualities by a triune sort of system. And, um, and so at any rate, we, we see things in, in dualistically. Now, one group of people that, and this is quite interesting, that don't have a sense of duality are psychopaths. Uh, because in fact, two parts of that system are gone. So there's no comparisons to be made. So if you, which may be the problem with psychopaths with their sense of morality, is there's nothing to compare it to. So they don't think things as of immoral or moral at all. So if you don't have something to bounce off of, right, then that thing it, hanging there loose never registers at anything. So in a sense... You know, we, we depend on these comparisons in the brain to know what we perceive, what we sense, and what our concepts are. And so people that, ha that don't have those, uh, it doesn't exist at all. So that's why, you know, psychopaths are at an advantage that way because they're not, they're, they're not bouncing off that, the moral reasoning part of, of all these decisions and perceptions. And, and so the... Uh, you know, I, uh, let me stop there to see if you need any clarification before I make one. Uh, please, actually, yeah. So when you say the uh, the sense of duality, so and, and psychopaths not having that, um, and one of the examples of duality you gave was uh, like the inside of the body and the outside of the body. If you didn't have that kind of duality, I would imagine it would almost be like a like a, a psychotic state, like a schizophrenic, not under, being able to grasp reality. So or people with some... propagnosia, pro where you don't have a sense of what belongs to your body. You can feel somebody touching you, move your leg and feel your leg, but it doesn't become part of you because the connection to self, that's another thing. When things are outside and then things that belong to you, that is, that's another duality. And... Um, and so you find that in dissociative disorders, like we said, schizophrenia and some sort of the dissociative psychoses, you will have that. In fact, those areas of the brain seem to be disconnected. So, yeah. Um, and so uh, on the question of whether or not there are limits to human knowledge, um, you know, well, you mentioned it, in the beginning. The yeah. Answer, I mean, uh, yeah. Okay. Tabula rasa. That point, sure. So without uh, a sense of duality of something, how do we know ultimate questions, you know, of consciousness, et cetera, unless we have something to compare it to, right? Where's the, there's no duality. It's like, I'm thinking here, but what's the opposite of that? What's the duality? I'm, 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 I'm here and I'm, you know, I'm here, but compared to what? Not existing, you know? And of course that, when that is a perception in many people, it sets up a sense of dread, it's an existential crisis, a sense of dread. So people, let's say who have cancer, terminal cancer, well, there's the pain of the actual cancer. And then there is the angst uh, have, of having it, am I going to die? And then there's the fear of dying and the pain of dying. And then there's the fear of not existing. And so people, some people with panic attacks have that, you know, they call it the yips. And, and it's like, no, I'm not scared of dying. I'm scared of being dead because what does that mean? It would, not existing. What does that mean? Well, imagine how you felt before you were born. You didn't exist. Well, you can't. And the, well, how do you feel about afterwards? Now, curiously, the one thing that seems to work on people who have this sense of dread uh, is psilocybin. 
So there's been clinical trials done with psilocybin with people. It was done at you know NIH clinical trial on on this existential. And uh, for people who don't know, sir, sir, to interrupt. For people who don't know, when you say psilocybin, the active ingredient like magic mushrooms. Correct. And okay. and so it in, and so in that case, they can dissociate the connections from an area of the brain called the mid cingulate, right down the center the center cortical part. That's the medial part, which is, is part of the part that is the ownership to yourself, not connection to the outside world, ownerships to yourself. So there is, uh, that's different than sensing the outside world. And in that system, if the psilocybin seems to turn that off, and when you take that circuit out, you lose the dread. And so you have people that say, yes, I know I'm going to die and I know I'm in pain, but I don't care about it the way I did, which is this awful this this dread uh that is so terrifying and so you, there you can see there is um a, a sense of duality with this because they understand the difference between existing and not existing at all uh but how do you how do you really understand that well you know that's how accessible is that now there are uh you know, there there are Eastern methods. We just had, a, I was a science editor and and, and um, an advisor to a film that just came out called the Dalai Lama, the uh, scientist. God, Dalai Lama called the scientist. And it's won like 13 film festival awards in Europe. It came out in Europe and, and now it'll, it'll be coming here. And, uh, and, and basically the Dalai Lama has always been not so much into science, but into, you know, things. He loves technical engineering things. He always did as a kid, too. And it's about him and about the development of his interest in, in that and, and taking his knowledge of Tibetan Buddhism from 2,300 years ago, uh, that, that brand of Buddhism. And they have certain ideas about uh, cosmology, uh, about multiverses, multiple universes, uh, they have ideas about the Big Bang. They have ideas about parallel universes. They have ideas about quantum mechanics. They don't call it that. But if you look at those insights that they had, it's basically that. It's, it's, it's quantum mechanics, and it's uh, also uh, cosmology as we know it. So, I, I mean, my job was to go through, compare his, his teaching and that teaching to modern scientific thoughts about not only cosmology and quantum mechanics, but also uh, cognitive sciences and genetics, where it's, a, it's more of a stretch with them. But the other part, you know, those insights, you can see it's in our head. Now, how is it in our head? Well, um, this, this is a question, and maybe, you know, this is maybe one of the ones that Noam Chomsky was talking about. He and I were advisors on, the, on a similar language project, by the way. And uh, so anyway, um, so... You know, so there's that, and then there's what's called the hard question of consciousness, to take it further. And the hard question of consciousness is how do we get from synapses and circuits to the sense that we have right now of us, we're talking to each other. How do you get to that? How do you make that jump? And nobody can imagine how that happens. It just, you know, we could, we know a lot about the neurotransmitters, the genetics, the connections, all the neuroanatomy, the pharmacology, and... We know a lot, but we don't know the most fundamental thing, which is called this hard con uh, question of consciousness, which is how do we make that jump to this experience that we're having of be being in the moment, as it were, and um, th that, that feeling we have in our head of thought. You know, what is that about? So I think maybe that's what he was talking about. Okay, so it, I, I'm going to see if I'm, I can sum up the, the argument that you gave here and, and maybe see if you agree with me on this. Um, uh, or if I'm getting it right. So basically, they're, the way we develop knowledge of of anything is by uh, you know exploring these dualities. The fact that we have knowledge of uh, ourself as separate from the world is because we acknowledge that duality of of self and the world, or inside and outside the body. Right. Um, and, those, and there are certain and those exist. Sorry. We're born with a sense of those already in a rudimentary way, and then whatever environment we have to be brought into, if it's, you know, it's in Greenland or it's in New York City, it's somewhat different, that shapes and sculpts that, those basic patterns, if you will, instead of big trees, okay. buildings. So, yeah, so we're born with this rudimentary sense of this, and then it's sculpted, and it's built into, and then it's put into these comparison circuits of duality that are within the brain. That's how it seems to work. That's it, 
Okay. And then and then the the next step in that argument would be there are certain dualities that we cannot explore. You know, like the uh, existing and non-existing. None of us know what non-existence would mean. Uh, have no way of grasping that experience, and therefore there are certain areas of knowledge that we just can't grasp. Does nothing that sound about right? Yeah, nothing to compare it to. There's no information to compare, and we use. We, ha we get knowledge about things by comparisons usually, right? And not because of the thing in itself, you know? There's a sort of the Kantian notion of, you know, going after what, what it was, what is that thing, what's the thing in itself? And this is, uh, you know, has been a question for thousands of years in philosophy, is the, what's the, what does it mean, the thing in itself? And, and it's always been a frustration for everybody uh, unless you bring in the comparisons, which are the dualities and, uh, yeah. Um. Part of the reason I wanted to get into that is because uh, I had talked to uh, Dean Falk recently. I, I don't know if you know her, but she's a, a yeah, neuroanthropologist. Sure. Yeah, we actually do. And, we, we have some overlapping research because, you know, she's a neuroanatomist who's done some the work on um, on, on on different, uh, you know, very interesting proto humans, hominids, if you will, and. Uh, and so, and we've done it on, we work on uh, Neanderthals and and more recent, about Paleolithics. We study the brain shapes and everything, and then we have the genetics. We try to reconstruct their lives. So I'm, I'm familiar with her great work, yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, she Because she had mentioned that in uh, within the academy and the sciences, and this kind of surprised me, but um, she said that a lot of people don't like to talk about uh like innate differences or, or they de-emphasize biology, particularly in fields like the social sciences. Um, is, is that your experience that people, uh, you know, like sex differences and things like that, that that's kind oh, of- Oh yeah, I new... mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, to a scientist, I'm talking about a hard scientist, not a social scientist. I mean, most of those problems are in the social sciences, philosophy and everything, uh, that side of the campus. And, and for us, you know, in biology and, and medical schools, it's not, it's this, this issue seems silly to us. And, um, but it's there. And well, I should point out that the, you know, the, the announcement came in the mid 1990s and, and CNN, uh, there were two scientists come up and they said they had discovered the fundamental difference in, in the homosexuals, a gay man's brains. And they did that by studying, uh, a man who had died of, of AIDS. And uh, well, that, that, that woman, that scientist was my first graduate student. She came in to my lab in 1978 at, at UCI before moving on to UCLA. And she said, let's try this in animals. She said, she says, I don't, she says, I don't know. I don't think uh, homosexuality is this, you know, genetic. And in fact, there's no sense that it's genetic per se yet. Um, but uh, she said it will start out doing with animals. So that turned out, it took her 20, 20 years and she's, she made the discovery, it's fantastic, that it was, you know, it's biological, not necessarily genetic, but biological and probably develops in utero. Um, and so, you know, we work on these uh, all the time. We just did discussions, you know, with, the, with another scientist here and she was an expert in sexual behavior. We always tried to guess how many ways can humans be and men be homosexual and women be lesbians and all these. We always have the discussions, you know, without any emotion because to us it's science. But as soon as you take it across the campus, you know, into poli you know, the political sciences and the social sciences, they always, you know, they make it political a lot. It's just unbelievable. It, not unbelievable. It, that happens and it still does. So for us, it's sort of childish uh, because just, you know, what is it? What is it in, in, in and without without any judgment on it, without you know making any political screaming about it. So um, yeah, I mean that's that's there, and there, therefore a lot of information is suppressed. That it's not published because of that. Um, a lot of the you know the um, it, it, editorial boards will will actually suppress certain things. Like there was a suppression of any information about nicotine that made it sound like, you know, it's just, an, it's another chemical, right? You know, why, uh, why is that bad? Well, Pete, there was a lot of, you know, heat uh, because of cancer and emphysema, et cetera, on smoking. And so they wouldn't publish anything that showed any positive effects of nicotine. And of course there are those, 
and uh, for example, in, 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 in females, nicotine in, improves reaction time. And we did a whole bunch of studies with PET scans and everything for about 10 years, like $40 million studies, and, and studied it. But there were certain no-nos. And, and, and it's also you run into, uh, and I think people uh, misunderstand the, the science articles versus the science journalists. And the, the people who get into science journalism are usually younger people who are very passionate. And I was, you know, every, every, mo every week to every month, uh, my pep talk to my students throughout the years was, look at the start, you know, start a week. Uh, we're probably wrong about what we're doing. So let's assume we're wrong. Uh, and, 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 and if you assume that you're wrong, you don't make any judgments. You just let the science tell you the facts. And, and the other thing was, and people say we're so passionate about it. So why would we need to be passionate? This stuff is so interesting. We don't need passion. That's for like science journalists. And that's where, you know, you find all this passion because otherwise they wouldn't be interested. You know, there's a lot of people interested in, uh, in, 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 in global warming and, in, in, you know, climate change, et cetera. They're all passionate about it because if it wasn't political, they wouldn't care about it at all. They'd be on to the next case. And so I am always very wary of somebody who, has to say that they're very passionate about some science thing. It's a red flag. It's be, and it usually means you want the answer to be a certain way, and it's that's the way it's then massaged. Uh, and it could be nicotine, it could be any homosexuality, it could be anything, and it's always comes out uh, quite inaccurate. So yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a, it's a huge problem. It's actually getting worse. It's getting worse. Oh yeah. It's good. I mean, why, fact, why is that? Well, because it's okay to speak just passionate about things without nothing. I mean, you end up you end up list, listening to little kids about you know what's the science, what's the truth about this because they're so passionate. They know nothing, right? And so we listen to them because we like to hear passion. And also, you can put a microphone in front of people like that, and it's usually older people who are pressing a political point, and they will recruit these kids and um, you know teenagers and youngsters because it's like. You know, listen to what the children say. Well, they don't know anything. It's all passion. And, you know, in two years, they'll be onto something else. And it's quite irresponsible, but it's you just a political ploy purely. And so uh, I, you know, whenever somebody says it's, you know, listen to, listen to the children or there's a young person, listen to their passion. It usually means that there's not enough there scientifically to support an argument. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be like the, the cornerstone of scientific discoveries, dispassionate inquiry. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you speaking, end up wishing for wishing for certain outcomes. That's not good. Um, speaking of uh, like sex differences, is, is it the case that men are more likely to get addicted to drugs? Well, you know, I I I, I wrote a, a, a the last chapter of the book Twenty Seven, and this you know Gene Simmons from the, the group Kiss. And so they contacted me and he said, can you write something about brain development and addiction? Because it's this idea, it's the myth that, uh, and mostly from, from my era, from our era, uh, from the 60s, where at least, you know, a number of very high profile musicians, rock musicians, were dying at 27 years of age. So it's some magic thing about the 27 Club. Well, it turns out it's really this, the 57 Club. Most, the, the, the peak of most uh, deaths of musicians of all sorts including rock musicians, the, the, you know, the drug, alcohol deaths and suicides is 57. So the number's wrong. But nonetheless, I, I, I did a whole chapter in that book on brain development and having to do with sex differences and, not, you know, and age differences and what the biology of addiction is. So if somebody wants a non-technical, slightly technical explanation, it's in that book 27 by Gene Simmons that just came out last year. So it's quite up to date. And, and um, you had mentioned something earlier about uh, uh, th this might be the wrong angle here, but epigenetics and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I had heard you talk, uh, not today, but in the past about like transgenerational violence. And yeah. one of the things that you mentioned um, off camera uh, last time we, we had our talk. Uh, was you had spoken to some people in uh, Black Lives Matter right. about uh, the impact of 
slavery and the right. centuries of violence. Um, and that's that gets encoded in people. Yeah. The, you know what? The way that the epigenetics works is that if you have a certain group of genetic alleles, that is, you have a specific combination of alleles that make you vulnerable to stress, for example, and it makes you vulnerable to personality disorders uh, and stress-related disorders, but also affects addiction, obesity. And this was shown in a in an epigenetic study from the uh, the Swiss, not the Swiss, the Swedish famines that occurred in the late 19th century, and what happened to the children and grandchildren, and it, what the effect it has on the children and grandchildren, and great grandchildren, of people from those famines, not only in Sweden but the ones in the 1930s, in in the Netherlands, the Dutch famines too, which was composed, that the uh, depending on when the the grandparents, parents, grandparents, great grandparents how old they were and whether they were males or females during those famines, well, they end up having kids with these problems at a very high rate. So even though, you know, you may be eating normally, you were like wired for obesity, wired for addiction, and it's tied to something that happened to your great grandfather. And this is these epigenetic marks. That is these permanent marks, which are uh, mostly little methyl groups of carbon with three hydrogens attached, very small chemical group, that under stress is uh, the cortisol that gets into the brain and different parts of the body, and it attaches to the promoters, that is the regulators of genes, like the stress genes, violence genes, obesity-related genes, and appetite, et cetera, and addiction, um, and it attaches to them. And instead of just attaching and then popping off, and what do I mean popping off? Well, everybody, every time you're exposed to like the col a cold virus, you get a new cold virus, your body will key start keying up the lymphocytes to make antibodies. Well, those those lymphocytes will undergo epigenetic changes with these these CH3 these methyl groups attached, and for the amount of time for two or three weeks, making new lymphocytes, new antibodies too to fight the infection. Once the infection is over with, those methyl groups pop off and it reverses. So we, we all undergo these these temporary epigenetic changes all the time. But if you have a certain uh, uh, kind of mix of genes and you undergo this, they're permanent. So they're always on. So you end up with somebody who's permanently wired to be obese, permanently wired for addiction, permanently wired for violence. So this is the uh, idea. When I, I gave a TED talk, it was about 13 years ago, on this with this hypothesis that um, – the, the source of violence around the world was 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 a transgenerational epigenetic violence that it was kind of the gift that keeps giving. And so the, the idea is that in certain neighborhoods or regions could be in the Gaza, could be in Los Angeles, could be in New York, could be in different places in Africa, Asia, anywhere. It doesn't the race or anything doesn't matter. But where the kids are being bullied constantly, you're seeing violence for at least three generations, four generations. And they're, uh, that they're going to, the mating chain, there will be different mating patterns probably. Uh, you, you know, the girls will tend to be hooking up with tough guys, right, and having kids um, because those guys can protect them. But also at a genetic, an epigenetic level, they'll start shifting the genetics. And so uh, you see this even in something like the, the children of Holocaust and grandchildren of Holocaust victims who have the same nightmares that the, their grandparents who were in the Holocaust have. It's like the, the, the nightmare sequences were, you know, the susceptibility was passed through the generations. So I had this, you know, this idea uh, of this, and this was a cause of uh, continuing violence in what are romantically called, you know, warrior cultures. It's not cute at all, right? But it happened in Turkey, Greece, Asia, the United States, maybe, and on and on. So at any rate, there was this idea that, uh, uh, and I gave a talk in Ukraine, in London, about Russia. I used the, the example from Russia that they had, you know, 300 years of czarist rule and then communist rule, which is just an extension of the czarist uh, rule. And after all these, you know, generations of abuse, that that group will be, you know, a certain large contingent who will 
vote in people who are dictators. They'll say, we want it. So you end up voting in people like Hitler, voting in people like Stalin. You're so used to the abuse that this is uh, becomes an expectancy. And it's a way for them to uh, to exist and be protected by, let's say, another bully, right? And so, so the idea, so I was talking to the people, some leadership from uh, Black Lives Matters, and I said, you know, you've got a, a case, and I gave them the Russian example, and there were other cases of this in Greece and uh, Turkey, et cetera, where um, you, you have this long series of abuse. And I said, if you look at slavery, that not blacks, but American blacks whose families w w were enslaved. They came as slaves. And so they have multiple uh, generations. And of course, a lot of the, um, if you look at the rate of violence of people, not, not blacks in America, but you know, inner city blacks whose grandparents and great grandparents, they come from slaves. So I said, look at, you know, in order to survive, you, you know, it's, it's, it could be the creation of kind of a protective warrior culture. So there's a higher level of aggression and violence. And he, and he goes, one guy goes, he goes, look, it, uh, I got to see if you could be on our, um, you know, on, maybe on our advisory board. And I said, I say, you're going to go back and tell these guys is this old gray haired white guy is going to be on the board. He says, no way, man. And he, and he called me, he said, sorry, we, we can't, really can't do it. And it was, and it was kind of, you know, there's too much to explain, you know, all this biology. To me, it's just biology. There's not, um, you know, it's ex explanatory. You're just looking for why things are. And, and usually what people do is try to deny that the reality exists, right? This is the way around it. Or blame th things that may not be uh, blameworthy. But it was just an explanation. And, and uh, but it's, in, you know, many cultures could use this. So it's an idea more about, you know, it could be tested, Right. So this is something right for experimentation, but it's so politically hot. Who's going to do this? And, you know, I've talked to people. I know people who are um, C-suite people uh, in very large corporations that I, you know, have known for some years. And they think it's very interesting. I give talks at the groups and they say, and I said, you're going to go back and talk to your, you know, your, your board and, you know, and your attorneys. And they said, there's no way we can fund this because in some way it'll be interpreted as being either sexist or racist or protecting violent, you know, criminals or, you know, it's all over the place from every angle. So it never gets funded, even though it's like a major problem throughout the world. And it's, uh, you know, it, I mean, Eastern Europe and in parts of Asia, all over the world. So it's not race or gender specific at all. But, you know, uh, it happened in certain places to certain people. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's a fascinating idea. Is is there any way you can reverse the effects of that? You know, for these epigenetic marks that are, if they're if they occur very early in life, the first few years of life, they tend to be permanent. Uh, if they happen later, they can be they can pop off, or there are other brain circuits that are there. There are parallel brain circuits, and it seems that women have more of these parallel brain circuits, to you know to solve certain problems. So uh, what appears to be plasticity, a lot of times is just using this parallel pathway that was always there. And so you lose one and then the other one comes online or with different, with, with different uh, challenges, you know, problems, for example, and puzzles that you use different ways of solving them. And so, uh, but if you have this early on, it, it's, it's very difficult to reverse. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on the board of a company that's looking at doing this uh, using, uh, you know, genetic editing. So, I mean, we're quite interested in this, uh, but you always run up against the political issues and, and every angle and, and very legitimate things about safety and ethics. And are we going to change the, the genome? Are we going to change humanity? Well, nature's doing that for us anyway, but, and, and certainly our societies are. So, um, so we're looking at, at this, uh, and we just we just did a play on this, reading Frankenstein, and we did a, a follow up. It was all about this issue, so we just did a play on this, you know, CRISPR and other gene editing, um, and it's, it surrounds the modern, you know, monster, if you will, the creature. Um, but we have a company that we started to to look at this. I'm sure there are numerous companies that are looking at it for good. But anytime there's powerful methods that they can always be used for what people consider bad, so it's always. Uh, you know, that's why you, 
that's one of the reasons why you always see these pharmaceutical advances, which are only 10% improvements. It's only 5%, 10%. They're not never big cures. Um, and, and, and part of it is, is that, and part of it is a marketing thing and, uh, and, and, and recovering funds. But uh, in, in this case, it, 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 it may be possible to reverse these things like psychopathy and these different disorders by knocking off those epigenetic marks and, and, and tweaking the, the genetic expression of these, you know, the, the, these epigenetic interactions that end up being either socially pernicious or very pernicious to the person's sanity and, you know, mental health. Okay, so we're, we're almost at uh, an hour here. So the last last question I want to ask you, this is something that I've, I've wanted to, um, I've, I've always wondered if there's something like a, a complete brain scan where they can tell you, uh, they can do a scan of your brain, say, okay, here are the weaknesses you got to watch out for. Uh, you might be vulnerable to uh, addiction or these kind of behaviors. Uh, here are your strengths. Um, here are, uh, you know, potential uh, signs of degeneration, and here's what you can do about it. Sure. Is, is there anything like that? Yeah. That, that's just like a total that's brain what, scan? Well, it's, it's more than that, because you, you can't get everything from just a brain scan. You can't get everything from just genetics or psychometric testing. So starting our group and our affiliated groups, uh, we started, um, I, I think, the first idea in psychiatry of personalized medicine. And so what we started in the, you know, the 90s, our, our group um, and, and our affiliate groups around the country, because we have meetings every year on this, is, uh, you know, the whole field is biological psychiatry. And a main part of that is called imaging genetics. That is, we use functional brain imaging, structural brain imaging always. So we'll do an, you know, an MRI and then an fMRI or, or PET scan or all three. We'll do EEGs to get the electrical activity. And then we do genetics. So we're looking for, because uh, everybody doesn't get things. You have to have certain genetics for you to get a certain thing and have certain vulnerabilities. And we found this out through schizophrenia, which is very much a genetic disease. And we did it with other disorders too. We've looked at this many ways, Alzheimer's and others. And, uh, and so we created a mathematical model where we took uh, general linear model equations, a series of general linear model equations, and statistically put together differences in brain images from different parts of the brain, um, especially for PET scan, but also functional MRI, and, and integrated that with the genetic alleles that people have, and together with their diagnosis and some of their psychometric measures, that is what you would get from a psychiatric exam. And we put those together and we're able to uh, come up with ways quickly, if somebody comes in, we can define what kind of schizophrenia they have and get right or, you know, in terms of depression and some other things and, um, and, and say, look it, we know right away that, you know, you should be undergoing this drug treatment or no drug treatment, maybe some cognitive behavioral therapy or what's called RTMS. So uh, we're able to individualize it very quickly. So that was our, uh, our group. I mean, this is very much a, a, a group, um, uh, the effort, and um, I remember when we first did this, we first came out with the uh, a, a way of doing this for schizophrenia. It was in like 2005, 2007, and we had this big board, and we used the, the idea. It was like uh, Magister Ludi, you know, Herman Hesse's book, The Glass Bead Game, where several experts are sitting in front of this huge uh, board of all these beads that make a pattern. He was never quite uh, specific about it, and they see patterns. So, uh, you know. We had, you know, I was a neuroanatomist looking for patterns, and they, and we had a geneticist, and psych physiologist, and st statistician. We sat in front of this big board with all these brain um, sections flying all the all over the place, and your visual system, in this very wide sense, you wouldn't see it in a computer with a small screen. You need it in this very broad uh, Panasonic type of, you know. A uh, very large uh, screen that fills up your visual field, your entire visual field, because the outside of your visual field can see patterns that the focal part that wouldn't see and vice versa. So we use your whole visual field and we're able to see patterns. So what would have taken about a year, a year and a half to discover a, gen a gene for the disorder, like in schizophrenia, took us one day. You know, the, it was like, ah, there it is. There's the pattern. 
And, you know, we saw that the next day we were writing the patent and writing the paper. And, and very quick, I, 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 you know, I had seen I was doing an interview on CNN, you know, the, the, the governor, um, uh, you know, sent down a whole crew because this is a whole different way of doing medicine, you know, personalized medicine, which was, you know, we're kind of at the beginning of that in psychiatry. And um, so it was a great thing. But it was it was the old Herman Hess thing of, uh, you know, Magister Ludi, seeing the patterns in the big board. Uh, well, uh, James Fallon, I, I, I don't know if I've said this before, but if I haven't, I'll say it now. Uh, I've interviewed some cool people, and you are by far my favorite guest. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Well, Duncan, you come into, you come into these uh, in a very creative way, and you also know what you're talking about. You do your, you do your back of work. So this is a, always a pleasure talking to you. Well, great. Uh, and, you know, maybe uh, after I come back after a year, we'll we'll do it again sometime. Okay. See you, Duncan. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for talking. Bye-bye.